let us get started again. So, before the break we left off at uh, the acid properties which transactions must satisfy and it is the job of the database to ensure that these properties are satisfied except for consistency which is the job of the programmer. Now, a transaction can be in different states while it is executing. So, it is active when it is still doing something the code for the transaction is still running. Now, when the code is finished running it is done all the updates the reads updates everything that it needed to do it is said to have partially committed ok. It is it succeeded in doing what it wanted to do, but some of the updates which it did may not yet be uh, in a safe place they may be in memory. So, if the power goes now the transaction updates will not actually be seen outside they are lost, but it has finished doing whatever it wanted to do may be in temporary in, in main memory. On the other hand it might have failed if uh, there is a problem during the transaction execution it cannot continue then it is said to have failed. So, now from partially committed what do you have to do the database system has to make sure that the updates of the transaction are saved on disk and may be backed up elsewhere and after that has happened then you say that the transaction is committed. So, from partially committed the transaction can become committed once the database has taken some extra steps to save all the updates somewhere. On in contrast once the transaction has failed the job of the database system is to undo whatever the transaction did and so that is called rolling back the transaction ok. So, the database system will roll back the transaction and restore the database state to its state prior to the start of that transaction. So, whatever updates it did are under. So, the database state is back to where it was with respect to this transaction. Other transactions may have come concurrently we do not worry about them here. Whatever it saw and updated you have to undo the updates. So, after this the transaction is said to have aborted it is clean and after it has aborted well you have some options depending on uh, you know you in some cases you can restart the transaction it will run now or hopefully will run now maybe the failure was simply some transient issue some time out on something which hopefully will resolve and if you run it again. In contrast uh, if there was a logical error in the transaction you are trying to withdraw money and uh, there is no money then it has to just quit completely. So, the transaction logic can ask for a rollback and quit completely if it finds there is a problem, but if the transaction logic did not request the rollback, but rather the database system found there was some other issue and rolled it back in some cases it might even restart, but typically that does not happen. So, in any code that you write you have to be aware that something can go wrong and the transaction can fail in the middle. It is not too common, but it can and does happen and then you may have to actually have a piece of code which tries to execute a transaction if it fails you may have to retry. If you use oracle there is a, a certain kind of failure uh, which is due to concurrency control if that happens you are supposed to retry the transaction you are supposed to run it again and hope it works. So, the states of the transaction can be shown in this diagram. Initially the transaction is active if something goes wrong it goes to a failed state if everything is gone fine and it has finished all the updates, but the updates have not yet been written to disk and so forth it is partially committed. After that the database system saves the updates it goes to committed at this point it is still possible for a power failure or something to happen or a disk failure at which point the transaction may go from partially committed to failed and then it may have to be aborted. Now, this aborted state can might actually be reached not immediately if there is a failure if power goes what is the state of that transaction? Some updates may have been written to disk others have not. So, it is a failed state it is not a partially it, it may be partially committed also, but now if power goes it is too late for that transaction 
uh, it goes before a certain point when its updates are written, then it moves to failed. Now, when power comes back up, the database has to roll back all those incomplete transactions and then those transactions reach an aborted state. In contrast, if all the updates are successfully written out, it reaches a committed state. Once it is committed, you cannot undo it. You cannot roll it back. You can run another transaction which negates the updates. So, if you transferred money from B to A, you can run a fresh transaction which transfers money from A to B. So, that is a logical sort of thing. But the database cannot simply roll back whatever actions it did after it has committed. Why? Because after it has committed, some other transaction may come and update the same thing. So, now you cannot just go and easily undo what this did. So, now all this conceptually is fine, but how do you use it? As a programmer, how on earth do you control what a transaction does? Um, so, the uh, SQL language allow support some constructs for handling transactions. Um, so, in SQL, a transaction begins implicitly. You don't say start transaction. As soon as you run a query, a transaction runs. Um, and you can either say commit work to commit the current transaction and begin a new one, or roll back work to cause the current transaction to abort. However, there is a little catch here. Pretty much every database system will do the following. If you run an SQL query or an update, it starts a transaction, runs that SQL query, and commits the transaction, assuming it committed successfully. And that is it. That is the transaction as far as SQL is concerned by default. So, if you have five different update statements in your transaction, what you thought was a logical transaction, the database may turn it into five, or six, five different transactions as far as the database is concerned, because by default, every SQL statement is a transaction by itself. That is not what you want. Okay? Now, what do you do? So, there are a couple of options. Database systems typically have a control which says, should a uh, SQL statement automatically commit or should you turn auto commit off? Okay? So, you can either do it by some configuration in the database or if you use um, uh, uh, JDBC or other than ODBC, uh, you can say something like this connection dot set auto commit false. So, auto commit means an SQL statement commits automatically. Turn it off, it means after it completes, the transaction is not committed, it is still active. So, you can do multiple SQL statements and then issue an SQL statement, commit work or rollback work, depending on what you want. So, now it is in your control. Okay. Or there are actually some other constructs which in SQL which say begin atomic and then do a whole bunch of stuff and then end. Uh, and before the end, you should have commit or rollback. So, that is another language constructed SQL programs, begin atomic. Again, not all databases support supported, but it is available in the standard at least. Okay, so, as far as the programmer is concerned, you write a transaction, you run queries. Now, any query which you run might fail. That query itself might uh, give an error. So, then you should be prepared to roll back work and quit. Okay? Um, in fact, what happens is the transaction, uh, the, the database, if you, if you have turned off auto commit and there is a bunch of things which are part of the same transaction, if something fails, it will implicitly roll back the whole transaction. And then you just exit, the database has taken care of rollback. Uh, but there may be other errors which you catch, you say, okay, there is a problem now, then I have to roll back or I commit. So, as a programmer, you have to look for error conditions and then either rollback or try some alternative and try to commit. Okay? So, you have to be careful about this. What exactly the database does, you have to figure out in, in case of an SQL error. Okay. So, this was the programmer's job. Now, what exactly does the system do? The first part is recovering from failure. This deals with atomicity and durability. Subsequently, we will look at isolation. Okay? So, C we are ignoring of acid. So, A and D we are going to look at first, I we are going to look at later. So, as I said, A and D are 
issues mainly because there are failures. If there were no failures, the system were perfect and you ran one transaction after another, every transaction should complete all its actions unless of course, there is an error condition and it will be durable, but that is not this case. So, what kind of failures can occur? Well, the first kind of failure is a logical error in a transaction no money in the account, so you have to roll back. Uh, another could be a system error, some kind of deadlock happening inside the system. The only way to resolve it is to roll back one of the transactions. Um, so, that is a simple transaction failure. There may also be a system failure, a power failure or other hardware or soft operating system fault and so on which causes the entire system to crash or, or the database component of the system to crash. Maybe not the operating system, but at least the database system. Now, in general a failure can be arbitrarily bad, you know, failure could potentially go and erase the whole database. In practice that does not happen. I mean, most failures do not do such bad things. Why? Because programmers have programmed things carefully by and large. If there is an error, the program stops. It does not continue on and create a mess. Badly designed programs can do that, but database systems are not badly designed. People have put a lot of effort into designing them. Operating systems have been carefully designed and tested. So, generally speaking, an error will not cause any uh, damage to the data. Once in a way, you do hear of database bugs which cause data loss, they are very, very rare. So, we will not worry about them, we will assume that the database implementers have taken care of that, so it does not happen. Um, and so, we make the fail stop assumption that non-volatile storage contents are assumed to not be corrupted by a system crash. Now, the database system internally does a variety of things. Uh, the only kind of corruption which you cannot prevent at the software level is if the disk, hard disk itself has a problem and the bytes of a file are corrupted. Okay. Then what do you do? You have to at least be able to detect it. So, the hard disk system has some checksums, what are called checksums to see if the data in the file which you have read is correct. If there is an error in what you have read, the disk system will say sorry, you cannot read this, the file is corrupted. If the file is corrupted, how do you uh, recover from it? Uh, so, if there is a disk failure, um, you will have to take some other actions to recover and we will not get into details of that, but uh, it is possible using the same mechanism which we use for durability. So, uh, the recovery subsystem of a database um, has to deal with failures and ensure atomicity and durability um, in spite of the failures. And the recovery subsystem of a database, the recovery algorithms actually have two parts. One is actions taken during normal transaction processing to ensure that enough information exists to recover from failure. So, while the database is executing normally, some things are written out in the log and some other actions are taken to save some information. Now, if a failure happens, then this saved up information is used to recover from the failure, either to roll back the transaction if it is to be aborted or if the transaction is committed to in effect redo it, if, if the updates were not quite made to the database, but the information about the updates is available, it can redo the actions, so that the database comes back to a state which reflects the completion of the transaction. So, the transactions updates are durable, they are in the database eventually after recovery. Just before recovery, they may not be in the actual place in the database, they may be updates may have been written to some log but it is not there actually in the proper place in the database. So, during recovery, you may have to look at that log and you meaning the database system has to look at the log and update the data, actual locations in the database. Okay. So, that is what the recovery algorithms do. Now, recovery algorithms have to deal with different kinds of storage. Uh, there is volatile storage like main memory, which does not survive any system crash. There is non-volatile storage, which does survive normal system crash, uh, like disk, tape, flash memory and so forth. However, these can also die in certain circumstances, disk failures do happen. 
So there is a third level of storage called stable storage, which is actually a mythical form of storage, which survives all failures. As I said, it is not it is mythical because it cannot actually be implemented, all failures is impossible. However, you can approximate it by maintaining multiple copies on distinct non-volatile media. So, if you have two disks, one here and another in Madras, uh, State Bank I think does that, they have a center in Belapur and another in Chennai and any transaction which runs, a copy is saved here and over there. So, even if this whole place uh, gets flooded, does not matter, that will be there, the data will be there. So, that is stable storage as far as we are concerned. And if we are not so paranoid, maybe you will just have a RAID system, two disks. So, if you write to both, if one of them fails, still the data is there on the other one. That may be good enough. The chance that both will fail is fairly remote. It can happen if the place burns down, but you are willing to take that risk. Then you can think of that as stable storage. So, now how do you implement atomicity and durability? Here is a scheme which is actually silly as far as the database is concerned but is used widely for text editors and others. Um, so, the idea is you have an old copy of the database. Whenever you make any updates, do not make it to the old copy, write to a completely new copy and after the transaction completes, you will update a pointer, a DB pointer which used to point there. After the transaction successfully completes, it is partially committed you update this pointer to point to the new copy. This new copy should have been flushed to stable storage first, then you update the pointer. Okay, so, that is used by editors. If you use a word or any other uh, you know, Emacs, yeah. VI, whatever you use, typically they will create a backup file. They will not directly update the file which you want to write to. They will only make all the changes in the backup file and when you say save, uh, some of them will simply copy the thing into the original file. So, there is a danger of corruption if a failure happens during the save, um, but others will do this. They will keep the old file, rename the old file and then make the pointer point to the new file. I mean the file name, the file name is the same, but the actual file underneath the file name will be referring instead of the old file, it will refer to the new copy of the file. Okay? So, this can be done for file updates of small files. Of course, um, it is not feasible for large databases. You are not going to copy, you know, 100 gigabytes every time. That is silly. Uh, it also does not handle concurrent transactions, even if the database is small. If two people want to concurrently make updates, what do you do? This guy has one copy, that guy has one copy. Now, which you cannot merge them. Okay? So, the point is you have to make updates directly in the shared database. So, what do you do? And the answer is using something called log based recovery. Uh, this is the standard which is used uh, all over. And the idea is that the updates performed by a, a transaction are written to a log. All the updates are written to a log. What is written to the log? You will say that you update this part of the database from this value to this value. So, the old value and the new value are both there. Why do you need the old value? Roll back. To roll it back. Why do you need the new value? To redo it if required. Okay? So, the log contains for every change made to the database, the log will have the old and the new value. So, if the database crashes before the update is performed, uh, you know, so the when you recover, the failure system will look at this log and see if the transaction was committed or aborted. So, it looks at each log record. If the transaction was committed eventually, what do you mean by committed? In the context of log based uh, recovery, as the transaction performs actions, it writes the old and the new values to the log. It also writes the new value to the database in memory but that may not yet have been written to disk. It may only be in memory. But the moment it finishes and it has written all the log records for its updates to the log and where is the log sitting? The log is temporarily in memory as the writes are happening, but then it is written to a file on stable storage. 
So, once all the updates of the transaction, the old and new value, for all the updates which is done, they are all written to stable storage, you can say the transaction is committed. Now, the stable storage has enough information. So, even if the database crashes now, when you recover, the log has enough information to redo the transaction. Therefore, you can say it is committed. But if a failure happens before this point where all the records are written, then the transaction cannot be committed. The database has failed, so you have to roll back the transaction. Okay? So, for those which have failed or uh, transactions have failed, you have to undo. So, the log records have old and new. If you undo, you use the old value. If you redo, you use the new value. This is the basic idea. And even if there are concurrent transactions, as long as they do not update the same data, if two guys concurrently update the same data, you are in trouble. And that is the job of the concurrency control part of the database system to ensure this does not actually happen. Assuming that does its job, this make a, there are a lot of details. I am hiding a lot of details here. A tremendous amount of details are being hidden here. But I just want you to understand that there is a log. You will see the log. If you look at the files in the database, you will see uh, uh, logs in there and a log uh, file depending on the database system. They have different names. There are directory structures for the log and the log contains these things, the old and new value and is used both for rollback and for uh, redo in case of a system failure. Sir. Yeah. Whenever we are committing the transactions, hmm. it is writing into the log file. It is yes. not directly updating the database. It actually updates the database also, but At that is time. in memory. No, it can one can happen immediately after the other, but the update is in memory. It, there is no guarantee that the update has gone to the disk at this point, but the log is immediately no, no, I flushed mean, to uh, writing uh, into the disk only, when it writes into the disk finally. Um, that is actually up to the database system. So, the database system might write to disk immediately, it might actually wait and gather multiple updates to the same page and then write that page to disk, that is up to the database system. The log based recovery gives it the flexibility, otherwise as soon as the update happens and the transaction wants to commit, all of the updates have to be written. The, then the overhead is more, I overhead. The log based recovery lets it get away with not writing it out immediately, which can uh, improve the speed of the database. It of course has to write it out eventually. It cannot postpone writing it indefinitely. Uh, so, it does get written out, may, but maybe after a little while. What I understand in spite of this uh, log based recovery, mm. we cannot ensure 100 percent recoverability because these logs are also for some time it is in the memory only. No. For a very short period like they define the size up to which like 2 MB or yeah. you give switching time. So, that the log switch happens. No, no, the log in, switch is a different. In case of Oracle Lamb. Log switch is a different thing. Uh, log in memory is a different. These are two orthogonal things. Mm -hmm. So, um, as long as the log records of a transaction have not been returned to stable storage, the transaction is still in the partially, partially committed, committed state. state. Okay. The moment that last log record, there is actually a commit log record at the end for that transaction. The moment the commit log record has been returned to stable storage, the transaction is committed. Okay. Okay, so, this is physically the definition of when a transaction switches from partially committed to committed in a typical database is when that commit log record has reached the log on stable storage, on disk. Will this ensure a 100 percent recoverability? Yes, yes. So, uh, once that log record has gone to stable storage, the transaction will, updates will not be lost, they are durable. Mm -hmm. And after that, you inform the, uh, the application program that gotcha. commit okay. is successful, then the application program informs the user that the commit was successful. Right? So, this is a normal mode of operation. In certain situations, you can, uh, uh, you know, speed up the process at a small risk by telling the uh, application it's committed even before this log record is written to disk. Yeah, it is possible to <coughs> set up the database to do that. That will speed up processing, but at a small risk. Uh, some applications do that; they are willing to take that risk. Okay, so recovering from failures is one issue. We have seen a very high level view of how recovery happens. There is another issue. 
if you have a centralized system for all of L i c and it goes down, um, fine it will recover, it may take a few minutes to recover or if it is not well designed, if the system is not powerful enough, it may take an hour to recover uh, or if the power has failed totally in that area, your generator has failed, it may take a several hours to recover. Now, you cannot shut down all the branches for that a long a time your people are waiting to do the work to transact with you. So, there is a notion of availability which means the database system or whatever system it is should be able to continue processing whatever work it is processing even in the presence of failures. Okay, how do you do that? So, you have several levels here. The most common kind of failures um, you know power failures what do you do? Put a UPS. What is the next most common kind of failure? Well, there are system crashes if you use a operating system which is flaky. If you use the you know newest version of uh, cutting edge version of even Linux, you may get into trouble. So, what you do is use a something which has been tested for a while, we know it is stable. So, you will use an operating system which is stable you will use hardware which is good. So, you minimize the chances of that, but still it can happen. So, the next most common sort of thing which we see after taking care of all of this by using good hardware and so forth are disk failures, especially we have a lot of disks, disks do fail. So, what do you do? Well, you use RAID. So, a uh, quick summary of RAID, the idea is that uh, it is actually here, uh, keep multiple copies of data on separate disks. It looks like a single file to you but underneath the operating system will keep two copies of the file on two disks. And if one of the disks fails, it is ok, the operating system will detect it is failed and if you read the file, it will continue to give you data from the other disk. But whenever you write and both the disks are available, it has to write to both. If one has failed and the other is available, when you do a write, it writes to that. Now, you have to deal with a failed disk somehow. So, uh, usually you have a hardware system which will indicate that this disk has failed, somebody has to go unplug the disk, put in a new disk and at that point the system will copy all the data from one disk to the other. So, a disk failure will be pretty much transparent, yeah the system will run a bit slower when the disk fails and when it is copying data again the system will run a little bit slower, but you do not have to even stop working just because it is failed. In contrast if your PC disk fails that is it, your PC is dead, right. It is ok, you can as a developer uh, you can afford that, uh, but on your central database server you cannot afford it, you have to use RAID. There are different types of RAID, I have just told you about the simplest kind of RAID which is called mirroring, there are other kinds, but this is the most common kind. Uh, if you want to know more chapter 11 of the database book has it. Ok, so disk failures can be masked by RAID systems. Um, network failures again there are ways of dealing with transient network failures, uh, but longer term network failures what do you do. Um, so, then uh, the way you interact with the database itself is slightly different. There are what are called persistent messaging systems, where a transaction is sent as a message like an email message, it is received, it is processed and then a message is sent back to you. And if the network goes down in between it is ok. You do not know whether the transaction is completed or not, but eventually when the network comes back up, you can find out, you can ask the database system did it complete and if not, well you do something about it. Okay, so, there are techniques to handle network issues like that. Uh, so, the one thing which you cannot really do much about here with a single system is a failure like a flood, fire, long power outage for whatever reason. Um, and that is not uncommon. On a couple of years ago, three years ago, I guess 2005, you know, half of Bombay was underwater. And, you know, nobody can survive that kind of a thing. Uh, you are, even if you are building a safe, you don't have power. Network is down. It cannot be used. Oh, so I was talking about network failure. With availability, network failure is actually a very important problem. It's it's a non-trivial problem. So you have a network connection to your 
data center. If that fiber gets cut, it happens all the time. Somebody does construction, cut, gone. What do you do? The center is cut off. Nobody is able to process transactions. What you do again is have redundancy. You have multiple different fibers coming from different places, so that if one gets cut, the other is still available and can continue working. Maybe it's a little bit slower, but you can continue. So again, as far as possible, you mask failures to maximize availability. Uh, but if you have a single center, there are some things which you cannot mask. Flood, fire, can't help it. So there the solution is to keep a backup at a remote site. And it looks like this conceptually. This is called the primary site where you're doing the transactions. Now all the updates that you do, uh, including the logs which you write particularly, are shipped over the network to a backup system. If the primary site is gone, then the backup system must now tell the world, hey, the primary is dead, come talk to me. So what do I mean by the world? Well, there are all these clients sitting here. Uh, they should know that they should stop talking to this fellow and start talking to this guy. So there, the application logic has to you know, see if it cannot talk to this guy, then it should try the other guy. And the other guy will say, no, I have not yet. I have not taken over yet. This guy is still alive. Maybe you are not able to reach him, but I have not yet taken over. Or he can say the king is dead. Long live the king and take over. So now once this guy takes over, it doesn't matter what happened to the primary guy. He's dead, gone, fine. For now, the secondary is active. When the primary comes back up, something has to be done. It has to get all the updates which were done at the secondary, at the backup, copy it back come back in sync, there is a protocol there, uh, which is non-trivial. And eventually, they are back in sync. And at that point, the primary may take over again. And the backup goes back to backup state. So all of this is part of uh, a remote backup setup. And most databases today support remote backup, although there are issues in practice. How do you detect failure? How do you know the primary is dead? Maybe it's just that you are not able to talk to the primary. Your line is cut. So you will need to have multiple communication links. Then you have what is called a heartbeat, some way to keep probing the primary and say, are you alive? Are you alive? Or keep receiving a message saying, I am alive. I am alive. That's called a heartbeat. So all this is part of high availability solutions. They are built in. You don't have to implement any of this. You should just be aware that these things are possible. Uh, once you have a database system in place, high availability options will do all this for you. Sir, when primary is dead, hmm. then what about the log, log records when backup? Uh, the log records are sent continuously. As they are written, they are sent to the backup. So the backup has the log records. So it can redo or uh, roll back transactions as required. That's the idea. OK. So then again, there are issues on transfer of control, which I just described. And in particular, to take up control, the backup site essentially performs recovery using its copy of the database and the log records. Okay, So in effect, it runs the recovery algorithm and comes back in sync. At that point, it can start processing fresh transactions. So there are a couple of different possibilities. One configuration is the backup does nothing normally. It just collects log records. And then when required, it suddenly starts recovery and then takes over. But that can be slow. So there's a hot spare configuration where backup system is actually continually processing log records as they arrive, applying the changes locally. And if the failure is detected, the backup can quickly roll back any incomplete transaction. And within a very short time, literally a few seconds, is ready to process new transactions. Okay, So that is uh, the hot spare is commonly used for, uh, yeah, I'm sure SBI uses a hot spare can take over instantly. Um, now, there are other alternatives to remote backup, which are based on replicated data. These generally don't uh, uh, you know, give very good performance. They're slower. There are transactional issues there. Um, but it's still useful in certain situations uh, where you don't want the cost of uh, you know, remote backup, uh, 
but it still gives you some amount of uh, fault tolerance and we won't get into that here so now we'll move on to the last part which is concurrent transactions before we do that are there any questions on recovery so in the yeah, say like the remote backup we might have a lag of some say like say like for single transaction mm. uh, yeah say say like some milliseconds mm. that uh, yeah the last transaction has not been uh, say yeah yeah copied into the yeah, log file or has not reached uh, the backup so yeah. in that case how it will be handled okay that's a good question um, so let's say that a transaction was declared committed the moment its log record reached the local disk, but that log record has not yet reached the remote backup, and now the primary dies, and that log record never reaches the backup. Okay? Then you have a problem. You have a transaction which uh, the primary thought is committed, but the backup thought is aborted. This can happen. If you want to avoid that, you will declare a transaction committed only after its log record has reached the backup, and the backup acknowledges saying, "Yeah, I have got it." Then you tell the uh, application program that the transaction is committed. All this uh, configuration has a costing as you mentioned in terms of the performance. Yeah. Definitely when a transaction has to commit at two places and synchronization is to be issued. Yes. There is performance, so there is uh, management, the human yeah, cost involved in managing it, keeping it up uh, and making sure that your high availability feature does not decrease availability. Yeah. You know, if, if your logs are not going through and the disk gets full. Yes, then, then even though one system is running it crashes that solved, that okay so you have to deal with all these kind of things okay so let's move on now to concurrent execution so why do we want to allow transactions to run concurrently why not let them run one at a time most of the transactions something like this are not that big right you update five records how long does it take to update five records you may read five records from disk each read may involve some uh, time to read it, maybe 10, 20 milliseconds. Uh, then it, so it maybe 20 milliseconds times 5, 100 milliseconds. And then it has to write those out, uh, another 100, 200 milliseconds. So maybe in about two, 300 milliseconds, your transaction finishes. Um, so why not just run things serially? Then what is the maximum rate you can get? Maybe you will get three, four transactions per second perfectly acceptable at a branch, single branch or even a divisional thing, maybe it is ok, it is good enough. But if you have a central thing for all of India, you do not have that flexibility. So what do you do? You have to um, run things concurrently and what is the benefit of running them concurrently? The idea is you can have increased processor and disk utilization. So the system has many resources, it has not just one actually, but today multiple CPUs it has multiple disks. So, if a transaction is waiting for a read to happen from disk 1, the other disks will be idle. If only one transaction is running, the other CPUs, all the CPUs will be idle and all the disks except that one disk are going to be idle. So, when it that finishes, maybe it does some CPU. So, now all the disks are idle and only one CPU is active. So, most of the time, most of the resources of the computer system are just lying idle if you run things serially, that is bad. So, if you can run them concurrently, maybe while this transaction is waiting for a read to complete, another transaction can be uh, using the CPU, a third transaction may be uh, you know executing a read or write to another disk. Okay, so, by allowing multiple concurrent transactions, you can actually make full use of the resources and yet have everything run very fast without major problems. But you have to be careful. What if all these transactions go and read or write the same data item? What happens then? There can be a mess. So if you are not careful, um, we'll, we saw an example of a transaction which was executing and another came in the middle and read inconsistent data. It can get worse. You may be writing some data, another guy can come and write, overwrite the same data and cause a complete mess. So, you have to have a mechanism. If you want this benefit and it is worth it, it's, people have spent a huge amount of effort on getting concurrency control right and that effort is worth it because you get 
very good response because of that. Another problem is if there is one slow transaction which takes 5 minutes, everybody is stuck behind this slow guy if you run it serially. That is a major problem. Um, in the olden days, uh, this was more common. You would have reservation systems where it would just hang for no apparent reason. Um, you would wait in the office for 20 minutes and say, okay, I give up or eventually it comes through. Uh, that may have been because of things like this. These days that does not happen because they are well designed. So, there are a lot of details in chapter 16 if you want to worry about it, but what we are going to do now is give a high level view of what are the issues. We are not going to look at in detail at how to do concurrency control. To understand what are the issues, you should understand what is a schedule. A uh, schedule is a sequence of instructions that specify what the transaction is doing. Okay? Uh, and it also shows the interaction between transactions. So, here is a schedule with two transactions. Um, in this particular schedule, what has happened? This transaction has read A multiplied it by, uh, uh, well, subtracted 10 percent from A and added it to B and written B back. And then this fellow started and read A, removed 50 from A and added 50 to B. So, there are two transactions which are both operating on the same A and B, but the schedule shows that this guy ran first, then this guy ran. So, what is this vertical line? It is time. This happened first, then this, then this, then this, then this. Okay, so that's what a schedule shows. What happened in time? You, as a programmer, don't have to worry about schedules, but I'm showing this to explain certain concepts which are coming up soon, called serializability, which you will see in practice. You'll see that word many times. Okay, so that is a schedule. Uh, so a schedule for a set of transaction consists of all instructions of those transactions. I showed you a schedule for two transactions and it preserves the order in which instructions appear in each individual transaction. Okay? If the two transactions run concurrently, then the schedule can look different. I um, will come back to this slide, but just show you an example. Here is an example where T 1 did some work, then T 2 did some work, then T 1 did some more work, then T 2 did some more work. This is a schedule where the transactions are mixed. They are running concurrently. I will come back to this slide in a bit. Um, so, a transaction that successfully completes will have a commit instruction as the last instruction. Um, and in the schedules which you will see, we sometimes omit the commit instruction, it is implicit. The last one, after the last one, immediately after the last one is a commit. Commit is a request to commit actually um, and we will assume that that happens uh, immediately. And a transaction that fails to uh, complete will have an abort instruction as the last instruction. Okay, so now we saw one schedule. In this schedule, one transaction ran, then the other. This is called a serial schedule. Serial ordering is there, one followed by another, followed by another. So, in this serial schedule, this is also serial. Now, T1 has run first, followed by T2. What is the difference between this and this? Here T1, T2, there T2 followed by T1. They are both serial schedules. Just because I call them 1 and 2 does not mean anything. Does not mean that 1 has to run first and then 2. It is just the name. Okay? So, these are serial schedules. Now, from the consistency requirement which we saw, we can say for sure that if a transaction is consistent, take any serial schedule. Initially, the database is consistent. Then after the first transaction completes, the database is consistent. Then the next one starts, and then the database is consistent. Everything is fine. So, th this is good. Serial schedules are good, but of course, they do not perform so well. What about schedules which are not serial? Take this one. It is not serial. These are called concurrent schedules. Now, in this particular thing, is it going to lead to disaster, this particular schedule? Some concurrent schedules can lead to disaster, but is this particular one leading to disaster? Actually, no. So, what happens here is this fellow reads A, finishes writing A. After that, this fellow does not touch A. Now, this fellow is reading A after this fellow ran. 
then this fellow is reading B, this guy did not touch B yet, this has read B and updated B, then this has read B. Now, if you look from the viewpoint of consistency, you can verify that the sum of A and B is preserved after this schedule, this particular schedule. There are other things where it would not be preserved, but here it is A and plus B will stay the same. The true transaction just moved values from A to B but the sum should be the same and it is in fact in this case. So, this schedule intuitively is in some sense it is okay, it is okay to run things like this, it is safe, but in what sense is it safe? You do not know yet, I have not explained in what sense this is safe and we will see that in a bit, but intuitively there is something about this schedule which makes it safe, it is okay and we want to allow it to run there are other schedules which are not safe, then we would not allow them to run. Um, just to step ahead of the next few slides, in this case, look at these two parts. If I could move that up and this down, in other words, in this particular schedule, this executed, then this executed. But suppose I flip them, I moved all of this and did it before all of this, would it make any difference to what each of them read? This is reading and writing B, this is reading and writing A. So, if I did this first, this will not change, right. So, I could conceptually move this up and this of course, corresponding will go down and that is the serial schedule, where T 1 ran, then T 2 ran. So, whatever this sees and whatever updates it does are exactly equivalent to the serial schedule, where T 1 runs, then T 2 runs. Therefore, we can say that this schedule is equivalent to that serial schedule, schedule 1, where T 1 ran followed by T 2 ran, it is equivalent in that each statement here reads the same values, each write writes the same values as that schedule and the final values are all the same as in that schedule, so it is equivalent in that sense. Okay. So, that is just the intuition, it is defined more formally. However, here is a bad schedule. Here, we have read A, subtracted A, we have not yet written it. In between, this fellow jumps in, it reads the old A, not the A after the subtracting 50, but the original A. It subtracts 10 percent from A, writes A, and then this fellow writes A. So, what has happened now? This update is completely lost. The value after this is 50 less than the original A and then this continues, this continues, you are in trouble. The final value of A is wrong. Very similar, what is the difference between these two schedules? Almost nothing. Um, there are only two small differences. One was write A has come here, read B has come here, read B causes another problem. There are two problems in this schedule. Okay. So, we want to allow this schedule, but not this. How do you do this? How do you recognize that this schedule is safe, but this one is not? How do you recognize it? And how do you ensure that only safe schedules are executed? That is the job of the concurrency control component. So, uh, here are a few uh, concepts. As I said before, the C assumption says that each transaction preserves consistency. Therefore, Serial execution of transactions preserves con consistency and we will say that a possibly concurrent schedule is serializable if it is equivalent to a serial schedule. What do you mean by equivalent? We will define that formally. Okay. There are actually multiple notions of equivalence. We are going to just use one notion called conflict equivalence. So, here we say that if a schedule S can be transformed into a schedule S prime, by a series of swaps of non-conflicting instructions, we say that S and S prime are conflict equivalent. So, if you go back here, we could swap these two, meaning move read B up ahead of write A. In the given order, write A occurs, then read B occurs, but we could flip it, do read uh, B and then do write A and the two do not conflict because they are touching completely different data items, so no conflict. Now, 
if you consider continue with read b versus this statement, there is no conflict. Similarly, this and this, there is no conflict. So, read b can be moved all the way up to here. Similarly, b equal to b plus 50 can move up, write b can move up. After moving all these things up, we have a serial schedule. So, what we found is that schedule s can be transformed into that other schedule by a series of swaps of non-conflicting instructions. And therefore, we will say that this schedule is serializable. It is not serial, it is concurrent, but it is serializable. This word is very important, serializable. You will see this uh, very often. And in particular here, we use the term conflict serializable. People usually omit the word conflict serializable and just say serializable. There are other notions of serializability, but this is the most commonly used notion. So, serializability for our purpose will be this, that you can, whatever order they executed, it is possible to swap whatever they did with non-conflicting things and come up with a serial order. And therefore, even though they ran concurrently, the final result is consistent, that is important and is exactly equivalent to result of some particular serial schedule. What was the serial order? We can figure that out if we wish. But in some sense, it does not matter. It may depend on which was submitted first, which was submitted second. If somebody entered, pressed enter a few seconds later, it could have been the other way. It does not matter. But it is equivalent to some serial order.